Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Father of life, from whom all good gifts come, send your Spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom open the horizons of our minds. Loosen our tongues to sing your praise and words beyond the power of speech. Without your spirit, we can never raise our voices in words of peace or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Mary, Mother of Mercy, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Anthony, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on the cross. Because of this, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every other name, so that at Jesus' name every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Morality to go on inside and 
outside of the soldier's camp. He always let a small army of gamblers and prostitutes and hucksters follow the Union Army wherever it went. Hooker was a thoroughly godless man and everybody knew it. The night before the Battle of Chancellorsville, Hooker gathered together his generals for a war council. And at that meeting, he spoke with his typical um, bombast, bravado. And he boasted, he bragged about what he was going to do to his enemies, the Southerners. He said that he would show them no mercy. He said, let God have mercy on them because I'll have none. Then he made the statement that shocked them all. He raised a hand, <coughs> pointed a finger toward heaven, and he said that Almighty God could not stop this army from winning the victory tomorrow. <laughs> Later that night, one of his generals, and General Winfield Scott Hancock, went back to his tent and wrote a letter to his wife and said, how can we ever hope to win under a commander who would dare to utter such blasphemy? Well, General Hooker planned to attack the Confederates, but the next day, he got the surprise of his life because General Lee attacked him. Fighting Joe Hooker was taken totally by surprise, caught completely off guard. In all the shock and confusion of battle, the fog of war, as they say, the officers on his staff said that a kind of paralysis came over him. Hooker became almost paralyzed with fear and indecision. A number of hours went by before Hooker ever came out of his headquarters to direct, direct the battle, but by that time it was too late. The rebels had pulled off one of the most spectacular flanking movements in all of military history, and they gave the Federal Army a bloody beating. For the North, Chancellorsville was a humiliating defeat. And uh, soon after, President Abraham Lincoln sacked Joseph Hooker and Hooker fell into disgrace. He had to live with the shame of that defeat and that blasphemy for the rest of his life. And his very name, his name itself became disgraced because after Chancellorsville, his name was forever associated with the infamous profession of the immoral women he allowed to follow his camp. Kind of an extreme example. But the point is this. This is what happens to the proud and the arrogant. In some mysterious way, the punishment for pride is built into the order of God's creation. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humble. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Friends, do you understand why it is that pride is such a danger to the life of the soul? And why it is that pride is the most deadly of the seven capital sins. Pride was the sin of Lucifer and the fallen angels who said, I will not serve. They rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven forever. Pride was the sin of Adam and Eve who wanted to be like God and decide for themselves what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false, what is good and what is evil without reference to God. This is the essence of sin. First comes pride, sin follows. Sin brings pain and suffering, misery and death into the world. Pride is the sin of the theological dissenters of our time. Who think they know better than the Holy Spirit. They always get it wrong. And every year they are more far out than they were the year before. The Bible calls pride the reservoir of all sin. In the book of Proverbs it says, when pride comes, disgrace comes, but with the humble there is wisdom. It says, pride goes before the fall, and God will repay to the full those whacked with pride. Now, what is pride? The Latin term is hubris. Pride is that exaggerated self-love that inclines us to see ourselves as being superior, better than others. Pride is that insidious desire for self-exaltation that leads us to seek our own honor and glory apart from the honor and glory of God. Pride sees the self as the center of all things. 
the measure of all truth, the measure of all reality, the standard of all morality. You know that we no longer live in a society that is based upon Judeo-Christian values. All that was over two generations ago. We live in a society, a culture, that is characterized by and dominated by paganism. What is paganism? The essence of paganism is idolatry. And the worst, the most insidious kind of idolatry is the worship of the self, the exaltation of the self over God. <laughs> A while back, I was driving on uh, an interstate. I got behind a car uh, that had one of those personalized license plates. The plate said, I am God. <laughs> capital I, space, capital M, space, G-O-D. I am God. I said to myself, that's it. That is the mindset of the modern world in a nutshell. Huh? Pride sets the self in opposition to God's wisdom and will. Pride sets up the self as the judge over God's word and God's law, the judge over everything and everybody. Pride always seeks to be the center of attention. Pride has always got to have its own way. Pride will always seek to control, dominate, and manipulate. Persons in situations. Hmm? When we examine our consciences and look back at our past lives, so often we see that so many of our worst moments, worst humiliations, embarrassing falls, biggest blunders, bad behaviors, broken relationships, <laughs> professional failures, life's most Bitter regrets and memories can be traced back to our own foolish, foolish pride. If we were in a Baptist church, this would be the point where all of you would say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's true. Right? I don't know about you, it's always been true in my life. Pride he is the great destroyer of marriages. <clears throat> the stumbling block. The grace and repentance. It's an obstacle to holiness of life, a mental block to forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation. It is a source of endless self-deception, vanity, through pride, so often comes the lust for power. It's the starting point, the catalyst for anger, violence, and war. Pride, unchecked, so often leads to family breakup. It is the biggest home wrecker of them all. It is an affront to God, an open door to the devil and the gateway to hell. And if you give it free reign, if you let pride rule your life, it will always be for you a, a disaster in the making. An accident waiting to happen because it always backfires on us in the end. And there's only one cure. There's only one antidote for it. It is humility. The tendency to pride, we say, is overcome only by its opposite corresponding virtue, the virtue of humility, the root and foundation of all virtue, without which no other virtue can grow very much in your life. For all of us, there is a simple rule in the spiritual life. No humility, no sanctity. If you have a big head, you're going to have a weak soul and a weak relationship with God. No humility, no merit in your good works in the sight of Almighty God. Pride, even though it may be secret, hidden pride in the form of selfishness or ulterior motives, will cancel out the meritorious nature of your good works in the sight of Almighty God. In other words, you can't store up more treasure in heaven if your treasure is poisoned by pride. Hmm? What is humility? Here's a simple rule to keep in mind. St. Teresa of Avila, doctor of the church, said, humility is truth. 
Humility is truth. What truth? It's the truth about us, the truth about ourselves. That is to say, humility is the moral virtue by which we have a correct opinion of ourselves and see ourselves more the way that God sees us. It is a true recognition of what we are and what we are worth in the eyes of God and in the sight of others. With Jesus Christ as our model, we can say that humility is a self-emptying, an emptying of self that allows God to work in us with His grace. I always pray that prayer in the season of Lent. Lord, let there be less of me and more of you. Let me say no to my will and yes to yours. He must increase and I must decrease. Hmm? The word humility, of course, comes from the Latin word humus, humus, which means <clears throat> earth, soil, dust, and dirt. The word humility reminds us of God's word to us in the book of Genesis. The words we hear as we begin the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Some of the newer translations say, remember that you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. Of course, uh, you come to Ash Wednesday, and you receive the ashes on your forehead, the sign of the cross. Um, but, you know, every time Ash Wednesday rolls around, we always have to laugh, not because it's funny, but more because it's pathetic. This never seems to fail. You'll see people at Mass that morning who no one has seen in church since the year began. <laughs> people have not darkened a church door in months, and they're in there getting their free ashes so they can wash out again, and so they think look very holy to the people around them. It's like the people are going to see them and say, oh, uh, he's got the black spot on his head. He must be really holy. Hmm? <laughs> but you know, of course, when you come to Mass on Ash Wednesday morning, when you receive the ashes on your forehead and the sign of the cross, the church is not saying, oh, you are so good, you are so devout, you're so holy. But the church is saying, this is what you're going to look like. This is what you're going to look like. This is what you're going to look like. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? We're all going to die. It's supposed to fill us with a sense of our mortality, a sense of humility. Humility. Humility reminds us that every good thing we have, every good gift we enjoy, every grace and blessing, every talent we can use comes from God and not from within ourselves. The Apostle St. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 7, wrote this. This treasure we possess in earthen vessels to make it clear that its surpassing power comes from God and not from us. Now it's important to understand what humility is not. Hmm? True humility does not, does not mean timidity or mediocrity or lack of initiative or self-loathing or defeatism or pessimism or all the like. True humility does not deny the real gifts and graces and talents that God has given to us. It just means we don't claim those gifts as our own, but as coming from God, knowing that God wants and expects and demands that we use those good gifts with right intention, with the help of His grace, to build up the body of Christ, the church, for his greater honor and glory and for the salvation of souls, no excuses. In other words, you don't take your talents and bury them in the ground. Hmm? You know, the church is full of very bright, gifted, talented individuals. They've got plenty of time and talent and treasure, but they will not use it. They never fail to bury their talents in the ground. People like that, we say, are practicing spiritual birth control. Right? They do nothing to build up the body of Christ. They do nothing to make adopted sons and daughters for God our Father. 
Think about this. We say, the virtue of humility and trust in God go hand in hand. The virtue of humility and confidence in God go hand in hand. You're going to find that many times in your life, God is going to call on you to do things or accomplish things far, far beyond your natural abilities. The grace of God helps us to do all those things we cannot hope to do by human strength alone. Our Lord said to St. Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Another thing is this. Being humble does not mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking less about yourself. So you can think more about others, more about God, God working through you. You're going to do more. You're going to accomplish far more when you know God's got your back. Hmm? You trust in the grace of God. Now, this has to be understood. To be a little soul, a humble soul in God's sight, does not mean the Christian is called to be a doormat, a pushover, or a wimp in serious matters. Especially when it comes to standing up for the truth, uh, defending the faith, defending your family. Hmm? If I would ask you to give me a good working definition of love in a truly Christian sense, could you do it? Would you know one? One of my favorite, uh, one of the most simple, I think, comes from the great theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas taught that love means wanting what is truly best for your neighbor. It means, he said, effectively willing your neighbor's good. The key word is effectively. In other words, not just wanting what is good for your neighbor, but doing what you can do, what you're able to do, to bring it about. So what could be better than God? What could be better than heaven? Perfect eternal happiness in God's heavenly kingdom. That's why the first, the most essential thing God wants spouses to do for each other and for their families is to pray for each other. Pray for each other. Help each other to get to heaven. That's what it's all about. Because the greatest love of all is concern for your loved one's eternal salvation. You know, it is not mercy. It is not humility. It's not charity to affirm people in their sins. Or just keep your mouth shut in the face of what you know is wrong. That is the most merciless thing that I can think of. Look at the lives of the saints. Right? They were great in humility, but at the same time, they were courageous, tenacious, audacious defenders of truth and opponents of evil. A great example uh, in my lifetime, I think, was Mother Teresa. St. Teresa of Calcutta. Now, I heard this story directly from the late Father Benedict Rochelle, who uh, knew Mother Teresa very well for many years. But uh, one time, Mother Teresa was invited to go to Russia, to Moscow, to receive an award for her humanitarian work in the old Soviet communist government. And Mother reluctantly accepted the invitation, not because she was seeking worldly honors or human praise, but because she had tried for years to open a house of her missionaries of charity in Russia, and she could never do it. The communists would never give permission. So Mother was thinking, well, maybe the Holy Spirit is opening a door for us here. Maybe this is the opportunity we were looking for. But she turned out to be right in the long run. So Mother went to Moscow, and um, the Soviets held this lavish award ceremony and they invited world news organizations and Mother Teresa gave a speech. And during her speech she noticed that the communist translator on the other side of the stage was deliberately mistranslating her words and turning her speech into a diatribe, a denunciation of the U.S. Western imperialism, capitalism and warmongering and all the like. 
So Mother Teresa stopped. She interrupted her speech in front of everyone. She walked across the stage, stood in front of the translator, shook a finger in his face and said, stop, stop. That is not what I said, and you know it. She said, either you'll translate my words correctly, or I will walk out of here right now, all this will be over. We got the message. She walked back across the stage and finished her speech. When it was over, one of the nuns with her said, Mother, how did you know? How did you know what he was saying? You don't speak Russian. And Mother said, no. No, I do not speak Russian, but the Holy Spirit does. <laughs> and there was a humble woman filled with the Holy Spirit and power. Hmm? Now, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, all of us are called to greatness in life. Hmm? We're called to be humble. But at the same time, we are called to be great. Great, that is, in the sight of heaven. In this sense, there is no contradiction between greatness and humility. For example, think of the life of our blessed mother, the most humble of all the God's creatures. Think of her words in the Gospel of St. Luke, her Magnificat. Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. What did I do? She acknowledged the great things God had done for her. She didn't try to hide them. She didn't try to deny them. But she was always giving God the praise, always giving God the glory, always directing everything back to God. God made something great happen in Mary. The greatest event in the history of the world, the incarnation took place within her virginal womb. And that is something God intends to be known and understood and honored. Mary's Humility, her perfect obedience to the Father's will, her eternal yes to God, her fiat reversed the disobedience of Eve and set in motion the events that would make the Paschal mystery, the mystery of our salvation, a reality. That is something God intends to be known and understood and honored. The saints have taught us that Mary is the masterpiece of God's creation. She is the masterpiece of God's grace on earth and the masterpiece of God's glory in heaven. It is interesting to take note of the fact that the high point, the crowning glory in all of God's creation is a woman, the great woman of revelation, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, Mary wears that crown of 12 stars because she is a true queen. She is the queen of heaven. She is the queen of angels and saints. She is the queen and mother of the church. She is queen and mother of all Christians everywhere, higher than angels and men. Do you ever think about this? Why does the Bible give us the moon as the symbol for Mary? By the book of Revelation, Our Lady stands as the woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. Why the moon? I'm sure that many times you have seen uh, representations of Our Lady in sacred artwork, and she is shown standing on top of a round object, on top of a sphere, or on top of a crescent, as in uh, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Those objects represent the moon. Why the moon? It is simply because the moon is not the source of the light. You see, the moon gives no light of its own. The moon only reflects the light. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. 
That is exactly what Mary does. Mary is not the light, but Mary reflects the light of her divine Son, Jesus Christ, the true light of the world. She is the Immaculate Conception. Now, not to get off subject here, but, you know, there is nothing so hard to understand about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. I can usually explain it so the most fundamental of fundamentalists can get it, if you just think of it like this. God determined to become man, right? God chose a mother for himself, right? God created his own mother, did he not? If you could create your own mother, how would you make it? I don't know how I would make my mother. All beautiful, all holy, all pure, all immaculate. That's exactly what God did. We honor Mary, the humble handmaid of the Lord, little in her own estimation, but incredibly great in the sight of heaven. Right. Pope St. John Paul II and Pope Benedict used to remind us, we are created for greatness. We're called to greatness in this sense. Right. Greatness is not what greatness is in the sight of the world. We know all the things the world holds in high esteem, right? Wealth, success, status, power, pleasure, fame, physical beauty, athletic prowess, and all of that, right? All these things that have no value whatsoever in the sight of Almighty God for eternity. St. Francis of Assisi used to say, remember that what you are, what you truly are, is what you are in the sight of Almighty God. Nothing more, nothing less. You know what greatness is in the sight of God? Greatness is holiness. Holiness, we say, is the alignment of the human will with the will of Almighty God. It is the fulfillment of God's word and God's will in your life, no matter who you are or where you are or what you are. That is how even the most little, hidden, humble, unknown soul can be great in the sight of heaven. That's what makes a saint. Hmm? You know, on those uh, sad occasions, those rare occasions, when I've had to refuse someone absolution in the confessional, most of the time uh, it was for the same thing. Most of the time it was because that person was absolutely convinced of his or her own goodness. His or her own righteousness while at the same time holding on to some grave sin with no firm purpose of amendment, no intention to change in their ways. There are people like this who come into the confessional with an attitude. The idea that uh, morality, what's right, what's wrong, is not what God says it is. It's not what the church has taught that it is for 2,000 years. It's what I say it is. And I'm going to live by my own rules, so don't try to tell me anything. Isn't this uh, precisely the mentality of those so-called Catholic politicians who support abortion, promote, enable, and defend the culture of death? You better it is based in pride. Hmm? Friends, the virtue of humility demands that all of us recognize the fact that we are sinners in need of God's mercy. And there can be no mercy without repentance. Hmm? Yes, God is infinitely loving and God is infinitely merciful. We have God's love and we have God's mercy, but the two are not always the same. And you've got to be able to make this distinction. The two are not always the same. They differ only in this. Listen. God's love is unconditional. God's mercy, the reception of God's mercy, is conditioned, dependent upon our willingness to repent and turn away from sin. 
And there can be no forgiveness of sins without true contrition, sorrow for sin, the firm purpose of amendment, right? In the season of Lent, we always read uh, Psalm 51. A humble, contrite heart, O oh God, you will not spurn. Now, you know, both the facts of history and your own experience will tell you that often it can be the case that VIPs, very important people, can be humble while ordinary Joes can be full of pride and arrogance. Big shots can be humble, little shots can be proud. Another great example of humility in, in our age, Pro St. John Paul II. In hmm? the 26 years of his pontificate, Pope St. John Paul II traveled around the world 13 times and visited 134 different countries, most of which were receiving a pope for the first time. Do you remember what JP2 used to do when he would get off the plane in another country? He walked down the steps from the plane, down on his hands and knees on the tarmac and kissed the ground. That was an expression, a gesture of affection and respect for the people of that land. Ultimately, an expression of his own humility. It is said that Pope St. John Paul II went to confession at least once a week, holy man that he was. Hmm? On Holy Thursday, presiding at the Mass of the Lord's Supper, carrying out the ceremony of washing the feet, not only did JP II wash the feet of the subjects, he would also kiss the feet. That's humility. It is said that uh, President Abraham Lincoln was a humble man. One time during the Civil War, President Lincoln was uh, visiting the wounded in a hospital in Washington, D.C. And he was walking through one of those big old hospital doors that would swing both ways. And there was this big, burly young man rushing through the same door at the same time going the opposite way. And he slammed into President Lincoln. President Lincoln fell backward onto the floor. And here is this big, angry young man standing over the President of the United States. The President's bodyguards are rushing forward. He's pointing at President Lincoln, yelling at him, Why don't you look where you're going, you big, long, lanky string bean? <laughs> President Lincoln calmly stood up, brushed himself off, and he said, Young man, what is troubling you on the inside? When I was a young army officer, I was privileged to meet uh, General Omar Brad Bradley. Uh, general Omar Bradley was a five-star general at that time, retired at that time. The highest ranking man in the American military, legendary figure of World War II. General Bradley uh, led American troops in the Normandy invasion of D-Day. It's kind of a legend in his own time, but everybody knew General Bradley was a very humble man. Always a kind man, always a gentleman. It is said that he never looked down on any GI. One time during World War II, General Bradley was leading American troops in combat in Sicily. He was up at the front where the hottest action was taking place, and, and the Germans are shelling our guys all over the all over the place, and the artillery rounds are bursting all around them. So uh, General Bradley had to run and take cover, and he ran and he jumped into a ditch by the side of the road. About a minute later, a GI, a private, came running over and jumped into the ditch next to him. He yelled over to him, Who is the idiot in charge of this operation? <laughs> General Bradley had his head down under his helmet and yelled back to him, Whoever he is, he ought to hang him. <laughs> Humility brings a sense of humor too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Pride. Like humility is the great destroyer of human relationships. The great destroyer of marriage and family life, especially among those couples who cannot find that little bit of humility within themselves to say the simple words, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or I love you. The absence of those kind of little words have destroyed countless millions of marriages over the years. 
I would say that the devil has a simple strategy to use against married couples. It's always the same. Never changes. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. I use the, uh, the imagery, the analogy of the wedge. The devil is always trying to drive the wedge of division between husband and wife. One blow at a time, little by little. And you couples who have been married for any length of time know this by experience, I'm sure. If he can't find the big things, important things, serious things to get you fighting with each other, he will use little things, petty things, trivial things, things that don't amount to a hill of beans to get you at each other's throats. If you let him, he plays on pride. He counts on pride. Pride is the open door, the open portal through which the devil can come in and destroy your marriage and get to your family. Pride is the evil tree that bears rotten fruits in the forms of selfishness, egotism, lack of forgiveness, lack of compassion, breakdown in interpersonal communication, envy, rivalry, suspicion, rash judgment, rudeness, denial of sin, you name it. I remember one time hearing this poor silly woman who came on TV telling her life story, uh, tales of love. And she was saying, I dated this guy for several years and a lot of the time he treated me like dirt. And she was talking about, you know, what a jerk this guy had been. Then out of nowhere she drops the bomb. And then, after we were married, <laughs> I said, did I hear that? Did I just hear that? After they were married, the guy treated her like dirt for all that time and she married him? How crazy can you get? <laughs> do you want to know a surefire way to wreck your life? Do you want to be truly miserable if you do marry someone filled with pride and arrogance? That will do it. There's an old saying, the man who is in love with himself will have no rivals. In the end, will have no rivals. Mm -hmm. Now here's a question for you. How can you detect, how can you discern the movements of pride within yourself? I have a little diagnostic test for you here. Uh, let me ask you these questions. Number one. In your heart of hearts, do you see yourself as being better than others because of who you are, what you have, what you know? When you're in conversation with others, do you always seem to call the subject back to yourself? You always seem to talk about yourself, your own interests, your own affairs. Is it all about you all the time? Are you overly concerned about what other people think of you? Are you always trying to make yourself look good? Build yourself up in the sight of others? Are you always ready to stretch the truth? Exaggerate? Or a lie if that's what it takes to do it? Are you one of those people who's always got to be right? Can't stand to be contradicted. Do you stick like glue to your own opinions even when they are proven definitively to be wrong? Hmm? You always have to have the last word. Do you find it easy to dissent from the teaching of the church in matters of faith and morals? Do you think you know better than the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, the whole church, the whole company of the saints? Are you ready to bet your immortal soul on that? That's a sucker's bet. Hmm? Does your practice of the Christian life essentially go to hell the moment you set foot in the voting booth? Do you cast your lot for the culture of death? Do you think God doesn't see you? 
Are you someone who is ultra sensitive to criticism? Can't stand even um, mild criticism, constructive criticism, a fraternal correction from someone close to you for your own good? Are you a gossip? Do you find it easy to gossip? Do you take pleasure in tearing down others? Um, do you take satisfaction in hearing somebody's good name being torn apart? Do you jump on every chance to point out the faults and the mistakes of others? Never miss a chance to criticize? Are you overly concerned or even obsessed with your physical appearance? Are you always worried about your looks? For example, how much money do you spend on clothes, shoes, your hair, cosmetics, and all the way? Do you go overboard with all that when you know there are people who don't even have the basic necessities of life? Do you find it hard to forgive? Even the slightest offense. When somebody hurts you, you always feel this instinctive, reactive need to strike back and get even, ready to hold a grudge. Mother Teresa used to say, to forgive takes love, but to forget takes humility. Lack of forgiveness is inherently self-destructive. It will eat you up on the inside. It will fester in your soul. It will steal the peace and joy from your soul. God wants it out of your life. I've heard it said that lack of forgiveness is the sulfuric acid of the spiritual life. What does sulfuric acid do? It burns and it disfigures everything it is splashed upon and in the end it eats away the container that holds it. I've also heard it said that for the Christian, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the person that you're mad at to die. <laughs> Doesn't work out very well, right? No. Is it true to say that a lot of what you do <coughs> tends to be done for the sake of appearances? When you do something good for somebody or for the church, you always feel a need to be noticed. You always seem to be motivated by a desire to win the praise of others. Like the Pharisees of old who performed all their good works to be seen, preferred the praise of men to the glory of God, you know the Holy Spirit wants no part of that. Does a lot of this sound familiar? Does it strike a nerve in you? If it does, these are the movements of pride. So here's the last question. How do we become humble? How do we get the virtue of humility? First thing to do, like any virtue that you need, Pray for it. The humble soul prays all the time in radical dependence on God. Second, remember that ordinarily, God humbles us by means of humiliations. And little humiliations seem to come our way all the time, don't they? We should accept them as coming from God, permitted by God for our sanctification. Third, have a sense of humor. Don't take yourself so seriously. Be a joyful person. You know, the Christian joy is an important part of your witness to the world around you. People around you have got to be able to see something good is happening in your life because of the practice of your faith. Joy is contagious, so is holiness, right? The humble soul is at peace in the hands of God. St. Teresa of Avila used to say, God save us from sad-faced saints. <laughs> Finally, imitate what is always the perfect model of humility, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus who said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus, who humbled himself to share in our humanity, taught his disciples to take the lowest place, wash the feet of the apostles, came to serve and not to be served, said, 
Come and learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, allowed himself to be spat upon, abandoned, betrayed,